So this is going to be objective 40. We are going to analyze data sets using statistics including mean, variance, standard deviation, and z-scores. Okay, um, Some of which you've heard before and some of which you haven't heard before. There's going to be lots of definitions in here um, because a lot of it is new. Um, have you heard of mean before? What is mean? It's the average. It's where you add all the numbers up and divide by how many you got. And the mean is still the mean. Okay? Nothing has changed. It is still the average. Um, variance, we're going to talk about what variance is. We're going to talk about what standard deviation is. And we're going to talk about what z-scores are. Okay? Any questions so far? Yes, no, maybe so? So, what we're first going to do is we're going to talk about population versus sample population, okay? So, when you take a survey, okay, you've seen surveys before, fill out this survey, you got to decide if it's a good survey or not. Have you ever heard reports on the news before that says, surveys show that 50% of this doesn't like this? Well, you got to look at how many is in the survey. If only 10 people are in the survey, is it a good survey? No. no. Um, if they, you know, when you give a survey, like if, for example, they want to know um, what clubs should be offered in this school, should we only ask females? Why not? Because they're going to give you different answers from guys. And so if we only ask the girls in the school what kind of clubs they want, then it's not going to be an accurate description of what kind of clubs most of the population. If we want to survey the school and um, figure out how many clubs, do we only want to survey seniors? Why? They're going to have different opinions than 8th and ninth graders. Okay, and 10th graders and 11th graders. So if I wanted to survey the school on um, what kind of clubs we want, I would probably want some of everybody, right? I'd want some girls, some boys. I'd need some 8th graders, some 9th graders, some 10th graders, some 11th graders, some 12th graders. You with me? And I need, do I need, would it be better to have 20 people? taking the survey or would it be better to have 200 people taking the survey? Why 200? Because you're going to have more opinions and, and it's probably going to be a better view of really what everybody wants. So what we're going to talk about is <coughs> when you give a survey, sometimes you give it to a population. That means you give it to the entire group that is being surveyed. Okay? So if I wanted to survey about what kind of clubs we want, Speaking of, don't let me forget, y'all need to sign up for your clubs today with me. Okay. Huh? <laughs> we need a ping pong club. Anyway, if I wanted to survey, if I'm going to survey the entire population, then who am I going to give the survey to? Every single 8th grader, every single ninth grader, every single 10th, 11th, and 12th grader. You with me? A population is going to be the entire group. And so when you do that, you use different um, variables, okay? So this is a Greek letter. It's called mu. looks like a U with a little tail on it, but it's called mu, M-U, okay? And that represents the mean when you're talking population. When you're talking variance, you use a sigma squared. And when you're talking standard deviation, you're going to talk use a sigma. Okay, now what do you recognize? What's the correlation from standard deviation to variance? Right, so let me ask you this. If the standard deviation is 3, what would the variance be? 9, because you square it, right? If the standard deviation is 5, then the variance would be 25. If the standard deviation is um, 9, then the variance is? 81. If the variance is 4, then what's the standard deviation? 2, because you take the square root of it, right? If the, if the variance is 36, then the standard deviation is 
six, you need to know that. You need to know that the variance is the square of the standard deviation, okay? But you will use those variables for that, okay? Likewise, sometimes when you give a survey out, you only take a sample of the population, okay, a small portion. Have you ever seen those ladies or men um, in Walmart or in the grocery store and they have little samples of the food? So my question is, if they say, would you like a sample, are you eating an entire piece of cake? Or are you eating just a small little portion of it? So if we use a sample, if I'm going to use a sample to survey what kind of clubs we want in the high school, then I'm not going to use all thousand and whatever students we have. I'm only going to use a portion of them. I might use 200 of them. And, you know, again, you if you're going to make a good survey, you need to make sure that you choose a little bit of everybody, right? Yes, little bit of girls, little bit of boys, little bit of eighth graders, little bit of ninth graders, little bit of seniors, a little bit of everybody. But if you're not going to survey the whole group, then it would be a sample. So if you're talking about a sample, you might see the X bar. It's an X with a bar over. It means the mean. So really what I want you to understand is this. A lot of these are used, these variables are used interchangeably, kind of like ain't and isn't. Properly, if we're talking for a sample, we should use the X bar. Properly, for a population, you should use the mu. But you know what? What do I want you to know about the mu and the x bar? They both mean the mean. So they both mean the average. They mean the same thing, and I want you to understand that. Okay? I want you to understand that for variance, sometimes you see sigma squared, and then sometimes you see s squared but they both mean variance, okay? And for standard deviation, sometimes you mean S, and I always remember that S for sample, okay? It's for standard deviation, but you use it for a sample, and the sigma is for the standard deviation. Now, I'm going to tell you that um, X bar is in our calculator, and the sigma is in our calculator, Okay, and it's going to tell you on your SOL, you know, when they read the directions on the SOL and they say, um, you may assume that they're going to tell you a couple things. They're going to, one, tell you, um, you may assume that no denominator is equal to zero. Because what about, what do we know about denominators equal to zero? Denominators, if the bottom of the fraction is equal to zero, no. No. It's undefined. You can't have a zero in the denominator. Okay. Remember I got you guys to stand up and I said put them in zero groups and y'all couldn't do it. So all they're saying on that part is that all of your problems are going to be doable. Okay. Because none of the denominator is going to end up to be zero. Okay. Um, they're also going to say you can assume for any standard deviation or variance problem that you are referring to an entire population. So when it says an entire population, we're going to want, the S is also in our calculator, So, but they both mean standard deviation. And the question is, is which one are you going to use? Are you going to use the S or are you going to use the sigma? And they're going to tell you for the SOL to use the sigma. So use for SOL, and it's going to be in your directions. I'll even show you that. I'll look up on the state website, and I'll show you your directions, and it's going to say, for any problem, including standard deviation and variance, you may assume that it's an entire population, and that will tell you. So that means for the SOL, you're going to always want the sigma. Now today, we're going to look at the difference between sigma and standard deviation, I mean in sample. Okay, we'll, go, we'll look at both. But for the SOL, you will be using the sigma. And it'll tell you that, again, in those directions that they read to you right before the SOL, they're going to tell you that. Okay? Questions on that? So let's look at example one. You can paraphrase. You don't have to write every little tidbit of this. Okay? At a local university... A random sample of 40 scholarship applicants is selected. The mean grade point average of the 40 applicants is calculated. Okay, 
so I want to know in this problem what is the population where are we where's our setting we are at a local university so what's the population what's the population of this school but so what is it it's no, what's it say on your definition? What's population? It's the entire group. So tell me, what's the entire group at our university? No. You telling me there's only 40 people that go to a university? I want to know the entire group. Well, just, I don't, I'm not looking for a number. I'm not looking for a number. I just want you to say everybody at the university is the population. In general, everybody at the university. That's your population. Okay, you got to look at where the setting is. We are at a university, so the population would be everybody at the university. Okay, and if I want to know in this case, what's our sample, what's the little piece, 40 applicants, the 40 applicants being surveyed is the sample, does that make sense? The population is every single person at the university, and in this case, the 40 applicants that were selected for the survey, that's our sample that we're going to use, okay? Questions on that? Let's look at another one. Okay, example two. A random sample of registered nurses is selected from all the hospitals in a three county area. It doesn't say three hospitals, three counties. Give me three counties in our area. Patrick, Henry, and Franklin. That'll work. Patrick, Henry, and Franklin. Three counties. And you have a sample of registered nurses from all the hospitals in those counties. Okay, so, and their median salary is calculated. So I want to know, where's our setting? We're in Patrick, we're in Henry, and we're in Franklin, and we're at the hospitals, right? So what's the population? Okay, all the nurses at all the hospitals in those three counties, right? That's your population. All the nurses at all the hospitals in those three counties. Okay? What's the sample that we are taking? The sample of registered nurses is the nurses that are selected, right? The nurses that they select, hmm, I'm going to let you take a survey, and I'm going to let you take a survey, and I'm going to let you take a survey. And so the sample is all, we don't know how many. I just want you to realize that the sample is going to be whoever is selected, right? So... The nurses, oops, that are selected for the survey. Okay. Do you understand the difference between the entire population and the samples that we are choosing? Everybody okay with that? Okay, so let's go to example three. Okay, 
Uh, just sketch it. You don't have to sketch every bit of that. I'm actually not even going to use that table over there. What I did when I first started teaching this is I had a bowl of numbers, test grades, and I had everybody choose their test grade. Okay? And so we went and looked. But I, what I want you to know is we're going to talk about something called a bell curve. And I want you to know and think about this. This happens pretty much every time you look at a test grade in any class. Grades are easy and we understand grades, right? Tell me this, in any class, even in this advanced class, you go to your English class, you go to your science class, or your history class, or your Spanish class, tell me, how many would make the tip top 100 score? Let's go to uh, science class or social studies class. Everybody got one of those? How many are going to make the A plus 98, 99, 100, 101 score? Not a, whole lot. Not a whole lot. I would say maybe about three. Okay. All right. How many would make like a B plus... Uh, okay, six or seven would make like a, in this range. How many are going to make the B minus C plus C range? So maybe like ten? Ten people? Okay. How many are going to make the low C D average? Not many, maybe about four? That'll work. And then how many actually fail? I think I think a lot of people say they do when they really don't. Okay. Okay. So well, anyway, shh. I would say in most classes that we go to, you only end up with one, or we'll even go two, that actually fail. Okay. So pretty much any class, any test grade that you go to. I used to have a teacher, a chemistry and physics teacher, and every test grade we had, he would put the grades up and he would graph it out. And if we did bar graphs on these, if I put my A's over here, and I'm just going to, A's would be three here, and then my B's would be six there, and then my C's would be 10 there, everybody understanding what I'm doing with my bar graphs? And then if I did my D's, I'd have, whoops, about 4 there. And then my F's would be 2 there, okay? So what happens to this is it makes this, if you connected the middle of each of those boxes, you would end up with this bell curve thingamajiggy, okay? this bell curve. And that happens, I could do this with shoe sizes. Okay? Tell me, if we took all the girls in eighth grade, think about it, how many, and you do boys, boys or girls, okay? How many have the itty bitty little feet? You know, a couple of us do, but how many? Just a few. Okay, so just a few have the itty bitty. How many of us have a small foot, but not almost average, but a little small? A little more. So like for a girl, that might be like a seven. Okay, how many have like the, for a girl, I would say the normal size foot would be an eight. Okay, um, and for a guy, a normal size foot would be a a nine, nine or ten? Nine or ten? A ten? Would a ten be normal? So how many, shh, listen to me. How many would have, so not very many people have the itty bitty small foot. More of them have a larger foot but still on the small side. How many people have an average size foot? Most people, right? Then how many have average but slightly on the larger side? Okay, not quite as many people. 
And then how many have like the super giant huge foot? Just a couple. Do you see what I did? You went from, and it made this, if you graphed it out, it would start out low and then grow and then it's going to go up and then it's going to go back down. Okay? You could do this with heights. How many are the shortest of short to short, short, short? Not very many. A couple. Okay? Shh, listen to me, please. How many are on the shorter side but close to average? A few more. How many are a normal average size height? Most everybody, right? And then you've got the people that are a little bit average but a little bit on the tall side. Okay, not quite as many people as the average. And then how many people are like super giant tall? Not very many. Okay, just a couple. You with me? And it would make this bell curve. Okay, it would make this bell curve. You could do this with a lot of different examples. So this is just another example of what it actually should have looked like when I graded, um, when I did that example with the class that I first did this with. Um, but this is what it makes. And you definitely need to draw this with the percentages, here is your bell curve, okay? Yes, you need to draw that, okay? You're going to be drawing a lot of bell curves. No, this is just the bell curve, and you need to entitle it the bell curve, and you need to know this, okay? So what I'm going to tell you is in the center of your bell curve is your mu. So... What do we understand our mu to be? Our mu is the same thing as the mean, the average. The average is in the center. And didn't we say that? In straight down where the average height was, or the average shoe foot was, or the average grade is, what's our average grade? What's average? A C is average. A C is average. A B is above average, and A is outstanding. Okay, but C is average. C is not bad, regardless of whether you think it's bad or not, but C is average. Okay, so it's in the middle. Okay, you need to know what you're going to have. These are standard deviations. Okay, so I think of this like a number line. Okay, so the mean is at zero. When you go one step to the right, you have gone one standard deviation. That sigma is a standard deviation, okay? When you go plus two to the right, you have gone two standard deviations. And when you've gone three to the right, three standard deviations. Likewise, if you go to the left, you have one standard deviation in a negative direction. That would be below average. You have two standard deviations in a negative direction and you have three standard deviations in a negative direction. Okay, normally you only have three this way and three this way. Okay, I need you to understand that within one standard deviation is 68%-ish. It's actually 68.2, okay, but this piece has 31.4% and this piece has 34.1%. And so between one standard deviation here and one standard deviation there, it is 68%. Okay? Between two standard deviations, how much is all of this worth? Okay? How many, how, what percent of our numbers are within two? What's all this put together? If this is 13.6, and this is 34.1, and this is 34.1, and that's 13.6, it's roughly going to be how much percentage total? Uh, Add it all together. 95. About 95%. So what I'm telling you is 68% of our numbers are going to fall within one standard deviation. How much is it? Like, if I graphed our test grades... How many of us, how many of our test grades would, would be within one standard deviation? 68%. So how much is 68%? More than half. More than half of us, if I put our test grades in here, would fall in this range. If I did within two standard deviations, 
95% of our numbers are going to be in between here. So how many of us would that be? 95% of our numbers. That's almost all of us are going to be within two standard deviations. Okay? And then how many is within three standard deviations? No. What's, e, what's all this? 2.1 plus 3.6 plus 34.1 plus 34.1 plus 13.6 plus 2.1. Plus plus Add it. If this much is 95, then all you got to do is add 2.1 on this side and add 2.1 on that side. It's going to be what? 9, 9, so roughly about 99%. Okay, so almost everybody is going to be between three standard deviations. Now, why do they not do 100%? Because you always, like if I'm doing test grades, what if you have that one person that on this end makes 101 you with me? You have that one person that just outdoes everybody. Or you might have that one person on this end where most everybody scored between 60 and 100. But you got that one person that just complete flat out bombed it and made a 12. You with me? That person's got to go out here. Okay? So you leave a little bit of room on the outsides for those outliers, for those extreme cases. Okay? All right, so let's keep going. Does everybody have this down with the percentages? Let's talk about, and some of this you will write, and some of this I'm not going to have you write, okay? So first of all, mean is x versus mu, x bar versus mu. And to find the mean, we're going to add the numbers and then divide by the total number of values in the data set. We already know that, and we call this the average, right? Add them up, divide by how many you got, that'll give you the mean. Okay? All I want you to do, I do not want you to write this, 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 or this. I want you to know that variance, which is sigma squared, or s squared, is the square of the standard deviation. So, again, to find variance, what are we going to need to know first? We're going to need to know the standard deviation, and then once we know the standard deviation, all we need to do is square it, and it's going to give us our variance. Okay? And then down at the bottom, the standard deviation is the calculated value that shows you how much the data deviates from the mean. Yes, I do. Okay, that's the definition. It's the calculated value that shows you how the data deviates from the mean. And basically, to me, it's going to show us how big our steps are to the first standard deviation, to the second standard deviation. you got to know, like, how far it is. Yes? Write everything except for what I have crossed out. All right. Let me just get all these definitions out to you, and then we can start working some problems and actually applying it, because I know this is like Greek to you for right now. Okay. We're also going to talk about the z-score, and the z-score represents the number of standard deviations that a given data is from the mean, and I'll explain that in just a minute. But you need to know the formula. The z-score is going to be equal to x minus the mean, minus your mu, divided by your standard deviation. So if you know your mean and you know your standard deviation, you can figure out what any z-score is for a specific data set. Like, for example, if I wanted to know where 
an 88 would fall if we're talking test scores. If I want to know the z-score for that, then if I know the mean, I can subtract and divide it by the standard deviation, and that'll give me the z-score for that. Okay. This formula will be on your formula sheet. Okay, this one will. But the more times we do it, I think you'll have it memorized. This one's a pretty simple one. Even though those um, variables look confusing, can you take two things, subtract them, and divide them? I think so. I always draw an O and put a little tail on it. What did I do? Sorry for all the writing. We just need to have these definitions and the equations to look back on. Alright, are we ready? Going once. Going twice. Gold. Okay, so here's just another picture of the bell curve. Okay, just another picture of it. So, we're going to take a look at this one example. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you that, and actually you don't need to write this. I'm going to change it a little bit. I'm going to tell you, we're going to talk test grades, and I'm going to tell you that the mean is 85 and the standard deviation is 5. It's 5 points. Okay? And that's all you need to know to draw a bell curve. And then we can ask, find all different questions about this. Okay, so first of all, we're going to draw a bell curve, and we're going to draw a bell curve for every single problem. And the more bell curves we draw, the better we will get at. Okay, so we're going to draw our bell curve. Down the middle is what? The average, which is what? Which is? It's the mu, actually, but it's your mean. It's 85. Would that make sense for an average test score to be 85? Yeah, that would make sense. That's average. Okay. When I tell you you're going to have three standard deviations to the right, and you're going to have three standard deviations to the left. Okay. And so I'm going to put this on like a number line. Right now, these are your Z scores down here. Right now, the mean is sitting at zero. You were sitting on neutral. You were sitting on the average. Okay, when you take a step to the left, you are at plus 1, then you are at plus 2, then you are at plus 3, just like a number line. Here you are at minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. And I'm going to tell you, these right here are your z-scores. Okay, so if I tell you your z-score is 1.2, where am I? I'm in between 1 and 2, and I'll figure out what kind of test score I'm going to come back to that 1.2 in a minute. Okay, now, if my standard deviation is 5, imagine me stepping on a number line. I have my number line on this yellow strip right here, okay, and I'm at 0. And I'm going to tell you my standard deviation is 5. That means when I take one step this way, that's 5 points, which means I'm now sitting on a 90. You with me? So this gap right here is five points. And so now I'm sitting on a 90. This gap is also five points. Each standard deviation is going to be the same size through the whole problem. So I'm now sitting on a 95. And if I take five more points, I'm going to be sitting at 100. Heck yeah. Okay, now what if I go five points in this direction? I'm at an 80, and if I take another step, I'm at a 75, and if I take a third step, I'm at a 
70. So what I want you to know is your standard deviation, the way I explain it, it explains how big each gap is. And that's not a very technical way of saying it, but that's how I understand it, okay? That's what your standard deviation is, how big your gap is. So back to if I tell you that the z-score is a 1.2, you told me that I'd be between 1 and 2 right here, right? So what would my score likely be? A 91, 92, not a 92.5. 92.5 is going to actually be halfway, right, between 90 and 95. So that would be more like a, what's a 92.5? What's its z-score? A 1.5. And I bet if I plugged it into that formula, it would come out to be that way. You with me? So what if I said, estimate the z-score for an 84. Where's an 84 going to fall? Right before the 85. So where would it be? What would the z-score be? Okay, so would it be a positive or a negative? It'd be a negative, maybe 0 0.2, I would agree, maybe, okay? What if I said, um, what might, uh, what z-score is going to be, or excuse me, what grade might be between 2 and 3? Give me a grade that might be between 2 and 3. A 96. Or a 97, or a 98. Now, what I need you to understand is, if I told you this about our scores, what if I said how many of our scores are between within one standard deviation? So that means one step this way and one step this way. How many of our scores are between an 80 and a 90? That's 10 points, but how many of our scores? A minute ago, remember those percentages? 68% are going to be in between an 80 and a 90. So over half of us are going to score between an 80 and a 90. Okay? Does that make sense? 68% of our scores, that's going to be over half of the class, is going to be between an 80 and a 90. What if I said how many are within two standard deviations? That means two steps this way, back to center, or two steps this way. So how many are within two steps on either side? 95 percent about is going to be between two standard deviations. You need to know that. How many are going to be between a 70 and a 100? 99. So what am I telling you? If everybody says, everybody always wants to know who made the highest grade, who made the lowest grades, what's the average grade, right? Don't you want to know that after a test? Who made the highest, who made the lowest? What if I told you that, and I put it on a bell curve and I said, Okay, three standard deviations, uh, 70 to 100, how many of our scores were falling between that? 99%. So I'm telling you, almost everybody made between a 70 and a 100. And you'd be like, thank goodness, because that probably means that you did not right. fail. You with me? Okay. Now, of course... It's not 100%. You might have that one person that made a 33. And that one person's going to be way down here. Again, this is about. So it might be that 100% did make between a 70. But in general, it's about 99%. So it, again, it might hit the 100 mark. But you got to leave a little room on this side and a little room on this side for those extreme cases. Okay. What if I gave a really hard extra credit and only one person got that 102? You with me? You got to leave a little room up there for that one person. Okay? All right. Uh, we got the mean. Let me ask you this. What if I wanted to find the variance of this? The variance is the sigma squared. Why is it 25? Because the standard deviation is 5. you got to know the standard deviation first, which is 5, and if you know the standard deviation, then you can find the variance. 
okay? Because it's the, the square of it, okay? All right, what we're going to do, let's answer these three questions and stop for the day. Okay, this is based on the bell curve we just, we just drew, okay? I want to know what z-score is a 92, okay? Now, here's the thing. I need to know exact. So, we could estimate where's the 92 going to fall in between? Wait a minute, wait, wait, no, 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 no. Z-scores. In, in between 1 and 2. Is everybody with me? But <coughs> I want to actually figure out the exact decimal, okay? So, if we use the formula, x minus mu divided by the standard deviation. X is your data point that you're actually referring to. What test grade am I wanting to know about? I want to know about 92. That's your X. Minus, do we know the mu? The mu is our mean. Do I know the mean? 85. Very good. Divided by the sigma, which is our standard deviation, which is 5. So, all you got to do, what is 92 minus 85? 7 divided by 5 is? 7 divided by 5? Get a decimal. 1.4. So, does it make sense that the z-score for a 92 is in between 1 and 2 and it's 1.4? And you told me a minute ago that 92.5 was going to be 1.5. So does it make sense that 92 is 1.4? Because it's pretty darn close to the middle. Okay. What would the z-score of a 75 be? And we should have known that because does it make sense that it matched up? Was it smack dab on the negative 2? Oh, yeah. Do you remember that if you look at your bell curve? So drawing the bell curve actually can give you some of the answers without having to use the formula. So, But you can use the formula. We're specifically talking about 75. So that's your x minus your mu which is 85, divided by 5, excuse me. And so this would be negative 10 divided by 5, which is negative 2, okay? And that should make sense because if you look at your bell curve, okay? Yes. And the more of these we draw, the better you're going to feel about it. So we're going to draw a lot of these, okay? So, therefore,